Yep. Cool. So anyway, we make this full screen. Ah, yeah, there we go. Focus mode. Cool. So uh, today we're going to be talking about cardio and different kinds of cardio. Um, a lot of the things that, you know, people have been encouraging is, all right, you can't lift, do more cardio, get outside more. Um, and I definitely think there's a right and wrong way to do it. And I think the right and wrong way to do it and understanding how to implement it into what you're currently doing, whether you have access to weights, whether you have access to only kettlebells and bands, whatever it is you're doing, um, understanding the different kinds of cardio and how they're going to impact your body. Um, is going to really help you kind of plan and figure out how to ease into it or how to tweak what you're currently doing. Um, but you really want to understand, you know, that not everything is equal. So that's what we're going to be going over. Um, two kinds of cardio, and it's very, very broad, and we'll be going over some different some different things. But the two broad categories is high intensity and low intensity. And just for the purposes of this, all we're going to say is that high intensity is stuff that's around 80% or higher of your heart rate. And low intensity is stuff that's under 80%. Um, it's a bit of a range, right? Uh, but as a general rule of thumb, if something's high intensity, it means it's going to be more of an interval type format because you can't sustain high intensity for a very long time. Uh, I mean, at least not safely. Uh, low intensity is also called steady state because that's usually a percentage of your heart rate that you can sustain for a very long time. So think of something like... Uh, doing uh, the sled sprints versus doing a marathon, right? Something very steady state for a very long period of time. Um, I highlighted the sled portion on both of them because it's not the movement that makes something high or low intensity. That's important to realize. Uh, all we're referring to is your heart rate. Um, so you can do, I do sled drags low intensity. So I do um, 40 minutes of sled drags with my weighted vest on some mornings. Um, and I'll do 10 minutes forward, 10 minutes backwards, 10 minutes forward, 10 minutes backwards. So that's 40 minutes in total. If that was high intensity at a heart rate of 80% or above, there's no way I'd be able to maintain that for a long period of time. So realize that it's not the movement that makes something higher low intensity. Um, it's the intent with which you move and the heart rate that comes out of that. Um, I put Tabata in quotes because here's the thing with Tabata. Um, a lot of people use it as a format for circuit training, right? Tabata burpees, Tabata kettlebell swings, Tabata air squats, uh, realizing that's not quite the way Tabata was intended to be used. It's definitely something you guys are welcome to research on your own, but the original intent of Tabata was to be used with a movement that you could, In it's originally written as eight rounds, 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. Uh, in those eight rounds, and they actually prescribe it where if you can't, you know, at the seventh, if you have a diminished drop in performance, don't do the eighth. It's not just empty work, it's supposed to be a certain t intensity. Um, but essentially, it should be a movement that you can push at 100%. Uh, the reason I mention that is I don't want people to think, all right, well, Tabata format, I can just do Tabata crunches. That's not going to be, that's not the intent of it. So realize if you're doing something Tabata for whatever reason, if that's something you choose is appropriate for you, um, you know, something like the assault bike would be great. You can do sprinting. Uh, if you don't understand the technique or how to warm up and ease into sprinting, um, I just think it's a little more higher risk versus reward if you're not trained in that and you don't have someone there watching you. Um, something like an assault bike, a rower, anything like that, you can usually go pretty hard and the risk is minimal. Um, but realize that Tabata isn't just, let me pop a movement into this uh, format. Uh, there's actual intent and purpose behind it. Um, you don't have to do Tabata though. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do uh, intervals. Um, but some of the pros and cons of each is low intensity. If you're someone that's not used to doing cardio, maybe you haven't been doing it, you're out of a habit, low intensity, steady state stuff is going to be way safer for beginners. Remember, I talked about the sprints, right? High risk versus uh, reward. Um, you know, I know someone, he was, he's a trainer and he, he's in great shape, but he just doesn't do sprints very often. He took one of his clients to the track because she's in varsity track. I think she's a junior. And uh, he decides for her last, uh, her last sprint, he's going to join her. And uh, then he texts me, yeah, I tore my hamstring. And I'm like, well, why would you do that? Like, you know, that's not your thing. That's not what you do. And sometimes, you know, yeah, you can be in great shape, but it's just a radically different stimulus. Um, so again, risk versus reward. As opposed to low intensity, um, it's a lot harder to mess your body up that way. The cool thing about low intensity, right, like going for a walk, for example, there's little to no recovery time. I also say that within reason. Um, 
if you were to walk a marathon, is that low intensity? Yes. Are you probably going to need to recover from that? Also, yes. So I mean low intensity within reason. If you're moving for 10 hours straight, even if it's by definition low intensity, you're still going to need to recover. Um, it's usually also more mentally tolerable for, mo for most people um, just because high intensity is uncomfortable. Um, most people might not want to chase that level of discomfort, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but realize it is a little bit more obtainable. Um, and it does elicit a positive endocrine response. So what I mean by that is that it's actually going to drop a lot of your stress hormone levels. Um, in short, it's going to help you recover better from a hormonal standpoint. The only downside of it, if you view it as a downside, this is a common downside of it, is the ex uh, workouts are going to take a little bit longer. Um, right, 10 minutes of high intensity versus 10 minutes of low intensity are going to yield very different results. You're going to, in general, want to build up to a higher uh, duration of low intensity. And it also doesn't in, uh, induce something called EPOC, which is excess post oxygen consumption. That's just a very fancy way of saying, if you guys have ever heard of the afterburn effect, right? If you do something really, really intense for 24 to 48, some studies even say 72 hours after that fact, you're going to have an elevated metabolism. Um, for some people, that's a selling point. If you look at things like Orange Theory, that's a very big part of their marketing. Um, you don't get that with low intensity. It's not the end of the world, but just something to be aware of. High intensity, on the other hand, it's going to be shorter workouts. Again, so if you're pressed for time, that might be more your speed. EPOC is induced, and it is going to stimulate, depending on the movement, uh, a lot of the same muscle fibers used in heavy lifting. Um, that's something I want to talk about a little bit, because I don't know if you guys have seen stuff on Instagram where people were like, well, I don't have access to a gym, and I can't deadlift heavy, so I'm going to do lots of sprints so I can hit those same muscle fibers and not lose my muscle mass. And that's great if you can stay injury-free doing it. Is it sustainable? can you keep doing it if I do a couple sprinting workouts and then strain something um, I'm still going to go backwards because now I have to be sedentary because I hurt myself uh, some cons of it uh, yeah put it right there right a beginner may pull their hamstring for an example running running hill sprints that's something to be um, mindful of uh, the endocrine response that you get from it does require recovery all that means is it is eliciting a hormonal response you are going to raise your stress hormones so i'm not a fan of people doing those intense boot camps five six seven days a week um, eventually fat loss does slow down you are at higher risk of injury sleep might be affected um, if you guys were here for my presentation on overtraining that's probably the population where it's not that you're under recovering or need to do better. It's you're literally doing way too much and you need to tone it down. Um, and another thing to realize is that a lot of people have a very different idea of what high intensity is and what high exertion is. Um, I usually wear a heart rate monitor for all of my cardio. The simple reason is I'm kind of a psycho and I will turn everything into high intensity unless I have heart rate monitor to babysit me. Um, and that's just, I can't come from a CrossFit background. Everything was, all right, go until you feel like dying. And I can't train that out of me, but I can monitor myself to make sure that I'm not taking it to that point, unless for whatever reason, that's the intent of the day. Um, nowadays, it's usually not. I don't hate myself anymore to do that to myself. Um, but realize those are kind of the pros and cons. So I'm not necessarily going to say that one is better than the other, but realize that if you are pushing your body in the lifting, um, you have a finite amount of money in your, in your recovery bank account, so to speak. Every time you do something that is, uh, demands recovery from your body, you're taking out of that bank account. So already lifting is subtracting a lot from that bank account. The moment you go to high intensity, subtracting even more, can you afford to do that? Is your recovery going to allow you to do that? For a lot of people, the answer is no. Um, so I just wanted to go over kind of what I do in a week um, and realize that what I do in a week is I've been building up a cardiovascular base for a while. There's been very few points in my life since I was like a teenager that I haven't consistently done cardio at least a couple times a week. Um, context is important. If you were, you know, thinking, all right, I'm going to get shredded this summer and I'm going to do boot camp, you know, I'm going to do uh, my beach body seven days a week. It's not going to work. You got to ease yourself into it the same way you would ease yourself into lifting. Um, but Sunday, I've been doing 
trying to stay on the hard 75 challenge. Um, one thing I've been really consistent with sticking to is the two uh, 40 to 45 minute sessions of cardio outside on top of my lifting workouts that I'm lifting that day. Um, so Sunday, for example, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys see me? You're good. You're good. Oh, it went away. Okay, I guess you can see me. Cool. Okay, so uh, in the mornings, I go for a 45 minute ruck. Um, you can do that with a weighted backpack. I like a weighted vest. I've done it with a weighted backpack. I think the weighted vest puts a little less pressure on my back and doesn't force me to hyperextend because everything's up on my upper back. Um, I'll do that in the morning. I'll keep my heart rate monitor on me. Um, I don't let my heart rate go over 150. I try to keep in the 140, 150 range the entire time. Somewhere around the middle of the day, afternoon, I'll do my squat workout. And then later after that, um, I did sled dragging and I did my alternating back and forth. Um, I have time on my hands. I'm not going out. So that's something to realize. And I'm not pushing stuff together, right? So my AM workout is not interfering with my squat workout. And then there's a nice amount of time between my squat and my PM workout. So I'm not trying to cram everything together. I'm not just sitting there working out for five hours straight. Um, if you look on Monday, right, I didn't lift. I did mobility. I did cycling. Um, in the morning, I did a two-mile run. I kept it at 150 beats per minute. Again, I'm regulating. I'm making sure I'm not going into that high-intensity zone. Um, and then if you look, the only crazy high-intensity day that I did, um, which, I mean, like, crazy high-intensity is subjective, but in comparison to the rest of the day, the only wild day was Thursday. So in the morning, um, I posted a little bit about it. I'm playing with the blood flow restriction training a little bit. I really liked how it felt in my upper body. Um, I've been playing with it in my lower body, and now I'm trying to see how it feels on uh, cardio days. Um, so I did do some cycling like that, and I used restriction bands on my legs. Um, really interesting. I can't say if I love it or hate it yet. Um, just kind of playing with it. That was my deadlift day, and in the evening I did uh, I did uh, sprints. So what I did was I did sled sprints a certain distance. Once I reached that marker, I would release the sled and continue to sprint the rest of the distance unweighted. Um, just a little bit of background is before I got into weightlifting and strength training, when I was like in my teens, before I gained a ton of weight, I was actually really really skinny, and my background was running. So that's something to keep in mind. Is I was on the track team. I was on the cross country team. Um, I did have coaching in that. Uh, if you've never sprinted before, if you've never run before, out of the blue is not, you know, especially if you've got a lot of extra weight on you, is not a good time to start. Um, as it is, it was several weeks of jogging and then easing into running before I was able to do any sprinting safely, I felt. Um, so that's something to realize. And then on Saturday, um, I did something called, this is from Ryan Fisher, it's called buddy building. Essentially, it's, it's, um, a partner workout and back and forth super low weight super high reps back and forth do as many as you can in one set until each person has accumulated x amount of reps just a cool way of getting your heart rate up getting a bunch of volume in and it's more interesting because there's a partner um so sometimes it's okay to make whatever you're doing to get your heart rate up uh it can involve weights a little bit that's fine there's nothing wrong with that and it's fun to make things interesting um, if you notice, I'm a creature of habit. There's a lot of weighted walks. There's a lot of cycling. There's a lot of running. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I don't, I get bored. So I wanted something different on Saturday and that's okay too. If you have access to a pool, great. I wish I did. Um, although for me, it's more flailing than anything else, but I don't drown. So that's good. Um, but the more you can mix it up, if you've got an assault bike, if you've got a rower, if you've got a skier, great. It doesn't be the same thing every single day. Um, but realize when I put this stuff together and I decide what I'm going to do, nothing that I do interferes with what my priority is, which is my lifting. So if I'm doing something on Wednesday that leaves me so beat up that I can't deadlift on Thursday, that to me is unacceptable. That shouldn't be happening. Um, so I would say pick what your priority is because you can't serve two masters there. It's one or the other. Um, and it doesn't have to be like you're splitting yourself in half. You don't have to feel like you're training for the CrossFit Games with your cardio. Um, realize, you know, going for a couple 10 minute walks in a day may be for your current level of fitness more than enough. Um, but realize that you know, it all depends on what your goals are. Are you trying to lose an astronomical amount of weight? Did you decide, hey, I want to pivot and I want to run a half marathon in several months? What exactly is your goal? Um, before you just start blindly doing whatever you see on Instagram, pick what your goal is. If your goal is, John, I want to, you know, just get 
you put on a lot of muscle, he's going to help you with that. And he's going to tell you what to do. If you tell him, Hey, my goal is to get super strong, but communicate with your coach. Don't just start blindly adding in cardio. Um, because chances are, if what you want to do is a radical pivot from what you're currently doing, we have ideas on how to get you there faster and how to get you there injury free. Don't just start blindly making changes because that's never going to work. Um, at best, it's not going to work. At worst, you're going to tweak something and then get mad at us. Um, it's usually how it works. So just closing notes, some stuff to realize is that um, I didn't go over days off. I don't take days off. And that's not to sound hardcore. It's that if I take a sedentary day off where I just like lounge on the couch, everything hurts. Everything feels stiff. Um, I don't move the same way. And that's just biology. Your lymphatic system isn't going to move. You, all your plumbing is meant to be moved by movement right? Um, so it's not going to flow. You're not going to feel good. Um, so I truly, truly, truly believe that low intensity active recovery things like going for a walk is going to be 10 times better for you than having a sedentary day off. If it's raining outside, go up and down your stairs a couple of times, do some jumping jacks or whatever you got to do. Get your heart rate up a couple times in that day. Um, but you're going to feel better. Uh, one of the worst things you can do, I don't know if you guys have so much feel on Facebook. I'm so tired of it where it's like, well, well, this is self-love as I sit here for 16 hours and the window pops up on Netflix saying, are you still there? Because you've been sitting there binge watching The Office for so long. Like, get up and do something. That's what you were designed to do. Um, your weekly workload should match your goals. So again, if you're not training to run a half marathon, there's no reason why you should decide tomorrow you're going to run five miles every day. Like, and even if you do want to run a half marathon, that's way too fast. There's a way to do stuff. Um, don't do stuff because other people are doing it. It should make sense for you, your body type, your injury history, your current weight. There's a lot of factors that go into it. But on the flip side of that coin, even if you're just getting into it, don't treat yourself like you're made of glass. If you're sore the first couple of days because you're not used to walking, that's fine. It doesn't necessarily mean you overdid it. Anytime you incorporate a new stimulus, you're going to be sore. Um, tough love, just suck it up. Sometimes change for the better, a little bit uncomfortable, and that's okay. Don't hurt yourself, but don't treat yourself like you're made out of glass either, because that's not doing you any help. Um, also take into consideration weight bearing versus non-weight bearing. When I was 40 pounds heavier, could I have gotten away with doing as much weighted walking and as much running and stuff as I'm doing? Probably not. Um, if you're over 200 pounds, would I recommend constantly doing a lot of weight bearing stuff? No, find a way to, you know, an assault bike, a rower, a skier. There's plenty of stuff that you can do to get your heart rate up. Uh, battle ropes, those are easy. Just order them online and you can anchor them to like a fence or a tree or anything. Uh, but keep that in mind. That, uh, respect your body type and respect what your body can do and avoid the repetitive movement patterns. Um, so there's a reason why, you know, when I do my sled drags, I'll mix it up and I'll throw the backwards sled drags in there. Um, I try to make even if it's the same a little bit different every time um, because if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again again I don't want you to treat you guys like you're made of glass but we also don't want to flirt with injury we don't want to be stupid about it um, if I decided to just go for a weighted walk every single day um, eventually my ankles and my Achilles and my feet would probably get tired of it um, so you want to get into a habit of doing something it doesn't mean it has to be the same thing every single day if you decide I'm gonna walk one day, cycle one day, and row another day, great. I just want you guys moving. Um, but realize there is too much of a good thing. Don't feel like you have to stick one movement and beat it into the ground. Just like we wouldn't tell you guys to bench every single day. You're going to blow out your elbows. Same principle applies. Uh, I rambled a lot. I don't know if John wants to chime in about what he's been doing, and especially different body type. He's a bigger guy. If there's other considerations that you have to keep in mind. Yeah, why don't you uh, – I thought, first off, great job. Uh, why don't you scroll down to your um, uh, your week? I think that's great. So I, I, I want to touch on a couple of things, just like your – I think you had a uh, yeah. kind of a template of your, like, your layout of the week. And I can kind of just go through um, – uh, just as, as an aside, I think this could be like a separate um, document in itself if you want to just let – I kind of did the same thing. I don't know how many people – to kind of like let people know, like, this is like kind of like what you're doing – you know, just for ideas, I think that's, that'd be great. Um, so a couple, couple of things here that I want to uh, highlight that I think is smart. Um, I see that, um, 
on her squat and deadlift days um, are kind of uh, some of the more intense um, kind of weighted cardio or just more intense cardio in general. Uh, so I think some of the things that uh, people make the mistake of, and this is something I kind of suggested to David because he's kind of getting ready for like, a, you know, he's in the law enforcement, he's getting ready for some fitness testing is just to kind of have like the high, the high intensity days and the lower intensity days kind of groups more together. So in general, your squatting and deadlifting is going to be the most intense uh, workouts in terms of lower back fatigue and in, ter in terms of neural fatigue. So if you are going to do some type of sprint or if you are going to do some sort of like heavy weighted carry or heavy weighted sled push, I do think um, having those on the, actually the same day uh, or, or, or after either the same day or after, makes a lot of sense. I would not recommend doing a crazy amount of like running or something that's going to get you like really sore and like your legs or low back uh, before you squat or before you deadlift. That's just not going to be a smart idea in terms of, you know, spinal loading and just longevity in general. So if you're going to do, uh, so planning your low intensity days, you could do like your lower intensity days, like the day before. So it looked like Saturday seemed like a pretty um, kind of mild day and it also looked like a Wednesday uh, was also a very kind of, so like Wednesday and Saturday were like the days before uh, Mel's most high intense intensity days. So I think that was kind of organized really well. Uh, so I think that's kind of important to, uh, and then like, you know, something like an upper body workout, like a bench workout, I would say is, you know, kind of moderate or lower intensity, unless you're like, you know, Julius Maddox or like Larry Williams, that's, you know, uh, most people are not like kind of using the kind of weight on a bench that's going to elicit some crazy like neural risk or, you know, if be like Benny's bench 800 in a shirt or something like that, that that's different. Uh, but for the average person, even if someone has like a three or 400 pound bench press, uh, it's not going to elicit the same response as like a five or 600 pound squat or deadlift. Um, it's just the amount of load that's going to be on your spine. is going to be way different. So uh, in terms of like intensity, uh, kind of, kind of uh, your high intensity work, uh, in terms of your lifting and cardiovascular training can be grouped together. Uh, I would say in general, if your goal is powerlifting, or on the side of doing just more low intensity work, uh, I think a lot of people think like, well, I'm a powerlifter, so I want to uh, push a heavy sled. I want to drag a heavy sled. I want to sprint and do like more kind of intense things. They think because they're, again, working like a similar, since you are working a similar um, energy system and a similar kind of uh, type two fibers, you don't want to kind of overuse those and you don't want to like kind of burn out your nervous system, so to speak. So I think having a balance of the yin and the yang and doing more low intensity work and kind of building that aerobic base. And we mentioned before, uh, we were talk, chatting yesterday uh, on our programming talk and we talked about how having that aerobic base is going to help your recovery, uh, not only in between sets, but also uh, in between workouts. So having that aerobic base is really, I think, a missing link. And then uh, my kind of only thing, I don't think you really need to worry about having low intensity work um, in your training until you get to like six, four to six weeks out, depending on like how high a level of a lifter you are. And most people probably just four to four weeks out. Um, I think you can kind of keep most of your cardio training in uh, for a long period of time. Um, and then like, obviously, once if you're at a high level, you know, if you're going for like a really big squat, really big deadlift and uh, starting to kind of chop out some of that stuff. But uh, to Mel's point about we were designed to move more. I kind of agree. And I also believe that, um, I also agree that, um, we are designed to move more. I think we're designed to either sprint and kind of like, we're designed to like probably kill an animal and, uh, and chill for a bit and walk for long distances. So that's kind of, we're either sprinting. It's either going to be like a stop and go really uh, high effort kind of, uh, exertion or just kind of like really low effort, exertion for a very extended period of time so either short duration high effort or long so like kind of stuff i don't think i kind of a lot of the medium uh that's why i'd even i'd err on the side of doing more walking or doing something that's more of like a, a stop and go kind of sprint jog or sprint and walk or whether that be in a bike a machine i don't do any traditional sprinting uh currently right now but i really like the assault bike for bigger guys and i really like weighted walking and, and just walking in general uh, I'm rotating in uh, a lot of the best the, the best weights. So I'm not only I'm not using the 20 pound vest all the time. Uh, I'm kind of rotating through the 12, the 12, and the 20, uh, depending on what my workout is. I'm also rotating through. Uh, this week, I decided I just took a week off from like doing my stairs because I just wanted to give myself a little bit of a break. 
and I'll start to kind of do more like uphill type stuff, which is also like a progression would be like kind of walking uphill or doing stadium stairs versus like walking on level ground. Um, the, so the last piece I would say is if you're just starting out, nothing wrong with just starting off with like a 10 minute walk or like 10 minute walk, 10 minutes of yoga. Uh, but I do think that it's good to just get in the habit of like moving every day. I think that's a good practice um, because, you know, taking like one off day can, again, you get a positive momentum or negative momentum. So doing something, physical every day even if it's low intensity i think it's just kind of good for from a habit standpoint uh for long longevity and you're and you will feel better uh just kind of moving a little bit more so that that's kind of my thing not just from a physiological standpoint but just from a mental and a and a habit standpoint and you, like i said you never i don't think anyone's ever gone for a walk or done like 10 minutes of yoga or 10 minutes of walking and felt worse like after so um barring some sort of like weird injury if you like have a broken foot or something but uh if you're a healthy individual and you're not really kind of dealing with any major injuries. You know, if you do 10 minutes of walking, 10 minutes of yoga, uh, you're always going to feel a little bit better, like once the kind of the blood's flowing and you're breathing. Uh, the last piece I'll say that's just kind of a little bit of a tip. Um, if you want to, uh, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, if you want to just kind of um, keep yourself honest and you want to do true low intensity work, uh, try doing the low intensity work, doing just nasal breathing only. So never kind of opening your mouth. Uh, if you're never opening your mouth, you're not going to be in a high intensity zone. So if you start to kind of kind of panic breath, then you know you're probably sprinting or going too fast. So if you could just nasal breathe only, uh, that's a really good way to kind of keep yourself in check. To me, I catch myself sometimes, but um, if you're doing a really focused, low intensity work, uh, and you want to keep yourself honest and kind of keep yourself in that aerobic zone, uh, try just breathing through. It's a lot harder th than it. Uh, than it looks, um, especially as your heart rate does start to climb a little bit and to kind of maintain that uh, kind of breathing pattern. So tr try that out. And uh, that'd be just something to try and kind of work towards. Uh, it may not be feasible like your first time doing it, uh, but doing like a longer duration, low intensity walk with just nasal breathing only is a really great uh, option. And uh, it'll definitely kind of make you feel really good and help calm you down uh, as well if you're feeling a little bit anxious. So uh, that's all I got. If you guys, if uh, Sammy or Zach, if you have any questions, um, but, um, yeah, I thought that Mel did a great job, uh, kind of going over the cardio. Um, but I think especially during this time, if you're not doing as much lifting, I think definitely spending a little bit more time just kind of getting outside and just kind of moving is a great, uh, a great option right now. Uh, Sammy, do you have any questions? Zach, do you have any questions? So I got, um, that was great, Mel. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go for it, Sammy. Hello. Um, yeah, I can hear you. So I've been, um, you know, I'm, I'm not on any kind of, yeah, my, um, my goals are all towards, you know, powerlifting and getting back into the gym and, and weight loss. You know, I'm still sticking to the ones I put up on the board in January. Um, so I just have a question on timing. Like, um, you know, I've been, I've been getting on the echo bike, you know, and I think the echo bike pretty much like their preset programs, like are, Tabata, what you described as Tabata, and I've been doing those programs. Um, you know, sometimes I've tried the 2010. I mostly do the 1020 um, for for a big guy. Yeah. I um, mean, I've been trying to do that in the morning, and then just doing walks throughout the day. Like I've been taking a lot of phone calls, just like while walking. Um, you know, so just on timing, like I've been I've been doing it during the morning, and it seems to well one like it just erases any brain fog like that you wake up with. Um, and that seems to be working is, I think, I just want to know, get, you know, while I got your feedback on like, is that the, the right time to do it? You know? So Sammy, your question about like the timing of the cardio or just like or, doing or, it first or, thing in the morning. I mean, I definitely find that it helps. Yeah. Yeah, the timing, just like the, the timing, like the separation of the timing. Like, and I, I generally work out at night. You know, I try, I'm actually trying to keep our schedule as close to what we're, our schedule will be when we get back into the gym. So I think, uh, so as far as, so yeah, Mel, I think mentioned that she does her thing first in the morning. I do that too. Just so you add a, it's, it's a nice habit. Uh, but um, if you're going to do like weightlifting and cardio, I guess in the same day, like how, uh, how much time do you have in between uh, for you personally? So I actually don't, I'm not doing any time in between right now besides uh, my, I eat my daily carrot right now and then uh, I go for my walk right after I do my lifting. But um, yeah, 
I would say like have some time in between if you could space it out, it'd be better. But uh, Mel, how, how much time are you having in between your uh, the cardio session and your uh, lifting session? Um, usually a lot. Um, I usually don't, depending on what time I get up, I'm usually getting up around 6.30-ish, 6.45-ish. Um, and then I'll, I'll head out the door at around 7. Uh, and then I don't lift until around 3.30 because um, Ryan comes over, so I have to wait for him to get home from work. Uh, so I have a big chunk of time. And then I usually have like an hour or so after I'll do the, the second chunk of cardio. Um, because in my mind, I feel like if I do, especially I started to do more hypertrophy range stuff for the lifting. Um, like right now, I almost fell coming up the stairs, like my whole body's trapped. So I can't do, I'm probably going to do cardio in like an hour. I got to build myself up to it. Um, but I find like if I try to smush things together, something's going to suffer. And even if I'm not, you know, doing high intensity cardio later, I still don't want to half ass it. So me personally, I want to be mentally in it. Um, you know, is that a little more inconvenient, especially like you, you know, you have kids at home and stuff and you have commitments. Yeah, it might not be feasible. Um, but I would try to do at least as much as you can where you don't feel like it's making an, an impact in your workout. If you feel like you don't need that much time to recover and you can hop right into it, great. Um, but I know for me personally, just with the way I've been pushing it, I definitely, and I'm in a calorie deficit, I need some more time to not be a zombie. So I think uh, the answer is always it depends, right? But I do think um, if you're kind of keeping a schedule and uh, Makes sense. You, and you are, uh, if you're keeping a schedule and if you're lifting in the afternoon, I think doing the cardio first thing in the morning, uh, the, the kind of the benefit for me of doing a, a cardiovascular exercise first thing in the morning is number one, more than likely it's, it's going to not be weight bearing. It's not, you're not going to be loading your spine. So there's really no consequence there. I do think that there is some limitations to lifting super heavy, super early. Uh, but with cardiovascular exercise, I don't really see much of a downside. You're going to get the blood flowing. You're going like you said, you're, you're going to, your brain's going to start to work a little bit better as the blood's flowing. Um, and what I like from a mental standpoint is you get to check that box off and you start off your day with some positive momentum. And I think that's tremendous. So like, I always feel really good. Now for me personally, I don't have that much time in between lifting and cardio. Uh, I would actually like to separate it more, uh, but just because of my work schedule right now and just trying to keep the gym running. I just like to, I, I like to knock out the cardio and my lifting like right away. Cause then I could just be more focused on uh, doing stuff for the gym and, and coaching you guys. So I just like to do all my stuff kind of for me personally first. I do all like my me stuff. Uh, so I kind of get my food, my foods in order and I get my cardio and my weightlifting done first thing in the morning. And then I can kind of switch gear, switch hats and I go from like athlete mode to uh, more, you know, and I put my coaching hat on, so to speak. So I kind of like to separate those just mentally for me personally. Um, I know that's different for everyone, but that's just w what I like to do. So that way I can kind of switch gears uh, because um, I'm sure, you know, Sammy, you lifted with me a, 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 quite a bit over the last few months. So, you know, like when I'm lifting and when I'm coaching, I'm, you know, I'm almost like a different person, um, you know, for, for better or for worse. So I can, I, I kind of, um, like I said, I always apologize, especially if I'm getting <laughs> getting ready for like a contest or something. There's a lot of weight on the bar because then it's like, it's like you know, once that switch is flipped, it's like I'm a different uh, different dude. Um, so um, you know, that's that's important for me. To, just for me to be able to switch gears like that, I have to like be in a different frame of mind when I'm coaching and then like when I'm lifting. Um, I'm you know, just from a whether it be a, a friendliness standpoint or an intensity standpoint or whatever. Um, I'm much more softer as like a coach and I'm much more like intense um, and, you know, as an athlete. So um, I kind of, that for me, that's like also like one of the reasons why I kind of do it the way it just logistically. So you need to do what, what whatever, do whatever you can uh, to keep it consistent. I think that's the most important thing, but I think in an ideal situation, if you can spread them out, uh, it would be better. And I think that there's some benefits like Stan Efforting also talks about like, I think that was actually one of the questions we had in the live Q and A is this like young kid was like asking about two a days. And I'm like, bro, I'm like, it's just like get like a workout and it'd be fine. But, but I think in a perfect world, I do think that there would be some uh, physiological benefit to like nutri nutrient partitioning and things like that. Uh, so I know we talked about that a little bit. So I think there is some benefit to training twice a day. Um, but I don't think it's, it's a hundred percent necessary for the amount of benefit 
that it's going to yield. Uh, but from an effort standpoint, like Mel mentioned, I think that's kind of probably the biggest one. Um, you're just going to be feel more recovered and feel more fresh and you're going to be able to have more output. So like right now, like I'm not really concerned with my strength. So I, it's whatever, if I was trying to, uh, get some cardio in and also, you know, hit an 800 pound squat, I definitely would separate them hundred percent. I'm not going to like, I'm not, I'm not doing 45 minutes of stairs before I get in, you know, put 800 on my back. It's just not going to happen. Like those are definitely going to be like separated quite a bit. Um, but right now I'm just not, I'm not really worried about like what I'm squatting, uh, in terms of load, you know, I'm just worried about how my legs look better. Um, so I'm not really as concerned if that, if that, does that make sense? Yeah. I, yeah, totally. And it sounds consistent with what I'm doing and, um, I'll just keep, uh, I'll just keep at it. And like, I think, I think you said the consistency is the main thing. Yeah. And then in terms of like the bike intervals, uh, just remind me, I, one of my notes I wrote, we have like a fantastic, um, finishers PDF. I don't think it's actually in the file section though. So I'll just make sure. So you could double check, but, um, um, I actually recommend, we talked about Tabata. I actually recommend, especially when you're starting out uh, positive rest to work. Uh, so I don't know if, you know, maybe Mel, you could talk about some intervals maybe that you've done. So I actually like, uh, uh, for the bike personally, and my personal favorite, this is just like what I do. I like to do 20 seconds of a all like all out, like die, like sprint. I'll do like uh, 15 to 20 seconds uh, as hard as I can without like the bike toppling over. Uh, so the echo, bike, <laughs> you know, like literally I'm trying to like, you know, make that, that fan. I'm, I'm trying to like, if there's someone in front of me, I'm trying to like blow them over with like, the fan, you know? So I'm going like all out as hard as I can for 20 seconds. And then I do a nice, easy pace for 40. So double the amount of rest. I'll start off with like somewhere between five to eight rounds. And over the course of several weeks, I will build that up to like maybe 12, 15, maybe upwards. I usually wouldn't go past 15, but um, so you start off with, you know, because I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, so that ends up being like basically one round is a minute, which is nice. So like if I want to do 15 minutes, that's 15, but I'll tell you in 10 minutes, I could really like kick your butt. Like you have a 10 minute interval workout like that. Whew. I mean, if you really are like, so that's like a great way. And what's nice about the echo of your salt bike, it's like, you really can't, I don't know. I don't want to say never, but it'd be like, you'd, it'd be very hard to hurt yourself on it. Uh, and you can really kick your, and like that thing jacks your heart rate up like no other. Um, and you can kind of play with it. I know like, um, you know, you could play with like doing some sprints with just your arms. Sometimes do some sprints with just your legs. You can kind of like add some variety, like to Mel's point, sometimes cardio can be very boring if you're doing the same thing all the time. So you could just do like arms only on that thing. You could do legs only. You could do arms and legs. You can go backwards on it. Um, you can go forwards on it. So you can, so there's a lot of options on just the bike itself that you could do, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize like how much, you know, versatility that you can use on it. Um, especially if like, let's say if I'm just using it as a, if I just want to flush out my upper body or just flush out my lower body, um, you know, there's a lot of options there depending on like what your, uh, what your goals are for that session. So I would kind of play with that, but I like that. Uh, I like the positive work to rest ratio and specifically like double the amount of rest uh, for the amount of work you're doing. So you could obviously, I like 20 seconds and 40 seconds cause it makes it an even minute. So that way it's just easy for me to keep track of cause I like easy math, but you can obviously play with, I would say anywhere from like more than you're not going to probably get a very productive sprint for more than 10 to 20 seconds. After that, it's just going to become medium intensity. Um, and then I like, you know, just double. So if I'm doing, you know, a 10 second sprint, you know, make it a, you know, 20 seconds of like a jog. So just nice and easy. And then, um, and then if it's like, you know, so just double the amount of uh, rest you're doing and then kind of, you can build up the rounds over time. Um, but I do have like a document that kind of discusses, um, um, uh, some of the different intervals that I've used in the past, but that's like, that's like my favorite, like one is that 20 seconds on 40 seconds. Um, you know, off like easy. So that's like the one I like to go. That's like my go-to. Uh, that's my cardio wad of the, of the, the year. <laughs> so makes sense. It's a, wait, what, it's not a, it's a, uh, oh, why? Wow. I can't, I can't, it's a way. Someone uh, asking for a friend. How would that be pronounced? <laughs> um, so that might give you some ideas. But yeah, I think like a true Tabata is like, it's really like near impossible because you're supposed yeah. to be going, like, you're, it's supposed to be max effort for 20 seconds. Like, no one does like Tabata burpee. Like, no one does, like, it's not like you could call it like the time frame is that, but you're like, 
you're kind of surviving for 20 seconds. You're not like going all out for 20 seconds. So it's kind of like a misnomer to Mel's point. But so I like, that's why I like the positive. Cause then you could, I rather see someone put more output out for that 20 seconds and then get more rest. I think that's more productive and it's more sustainable than like have the negative, the negative like work to rest is like, you know, that's very high level stuff. I don't think people do it properly. Um, it's, it's cool to say like I'm doing Tabata burpees or whatever, but, um, I don't think it's it's very effective for most for most people. Okay, yeah, there's got to be a major correction factor for Tabata for over 300 pounders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think they did. This, I don't think they did the study with super heavyweight lifters either. I think <laughs> I think it was like with, with like probably like 140 pound cyclists. So, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I think that's good. I think that's probably unless you guys have anything else. Uh, if Mel, if you have anything else to add to that, but I think that's probably a good place to um, to shut the recording down. But you guys just let me know before I do. Uh, yeah, the only other thing that I've been playing with is just like threshold training where um, doing, and this is where I will do body weight stuff um, because I find it's a lot easier to take it into high intensity and break through and go over that 80% if I'm doing something like sprinting or, or on this bicycle, but I will do something like, uh, like I think on Thursday I did 30 seconds, so I'll do um, 30 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest, but then I have a minute rests at the end of all the movements and that's one round and I'll do that five times so I don't have I have a negative rest and then at the end I have a positive rest kind of because of 30 so it ends up um I kind of like that more than just the positive rest but that's just me personally I'm a little bit of a psycho um but I'll do stuff like body weight squats push-ups I have battle rope kettlebell swings um I've been playing with Annie Vest while doing that and hovering and keeping my my heart rate high but not spiking it to the point of like that, like death range and trying to keep it in that range the whole time. Um, and that's just a different way of doing stuff. Again, just another option. At the end of the day, if you're not, you know, a performance athlete in that sense where you need the cardio, um, it's just another tool to stop things from getting boring. Cool. I like that a lot. And I think that it's really important to understand um, in that example, it's not something like a sprint or a bike where like, you know, so I think of the body weight training um, and like body weight and bands and kettlebells uh, lend itself more to that type of workout. I think that's very um, uh, typical of like how like a boot camp would like run a class and things so that we, some people call it like coin it like metabolic strength training, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, that's a great way to, for people to kind of, and that may be something we'll talk about too uh, moving forward. I think that's a great way just to do assistance work is just kind of have it like on a clock like that. Cause I, know, I think a lot of people, especially um i don't really like rest at all <laughs> uh but probably that's probably a, a really good way to do it is just kind of give yourself like a specific amount of rest like after a certain period um or you can kind of like you know have that uh negative rest time as like if you're doing a filler or something like a little bit like lower intensity like like a band pull apart you're kind of like resting but like you're kind of not or like a plank or something where you're kind of something like kind of easy but you're still even doing something easy for a period of time, like you're still going to keep your heart rate elevated for longer. So that's a great way to like uh, kind of organize your assistance work is that you have like, uh, you know, something that's, um, I would say in that example, like obviously the kettlebell swing is going to be more like plyometric in a sense and it's more aggressive. That's going to jack your heart rate up. And if you're doing like, um, you know, some sort of like push up or body weight squat or band exercise, um, that will jack your heart rate up too, but not, not to the same extent a kettlebell swing will. Uh, just because of the speed of the movement is is different, um, so I think that's that's great too. And you can kind of organize your assistance work uh, like that. So if you are like following our program, for example, uh, you might like you know we talk about this all the time, but you kind of maybe you do all the exercises and the accessories as a circuit, and then you only do after you've got to go through a round, you give yourself a minute rest or thirty seconds rest, and then you repeat again. Uh, that way, you can kind of give a really hard effort for that period of time but then you are kind of getting, and that'll allow you to lift, use a heavier weight. Uh, if you have no rest at all, then you're going to be kind of limited uh, more by like your cardiovascular system than you are like your, your muscular system. So great stuff. I thought that was really good. I think there was a lot of good takeaways there. Uh, and I also, I have to, now I have to find that document to upload, but uh, we'll make sure we upload this to, um, uh, to the Facebook group as well. And if you guys have any other, uh, questions in the future uh, on cardio. 
uh, definitely let us know. So I'm going to stop the recording there.